welcome too. If we have people coming a little bit later in the uh, overflow room, some of them may already be trickling in. We have some space downstairs if you see people crowding into the doors later on. The Wilson Center, for those of you who haven't been here before, was established by Congress in 1968 as a living memorial to the 28th president, the only president to date to have earned the PhD. The Woodrow Wilson Center strives to bring the best international and American scholarship to bear on policy formulation and to encourage collaboration between academics, political leaders, and private sector experts throughout the world to solve common challenges. The Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Wilson Center was founded in 2008 by Ambassador Stapleton Roy on the conviction that well-informed collaborative relations between the United States and China are essential to global security. The Kissinger Institute is sponsoring, co-sponsoring today's program with the Wilson Center's Asia Institute, and I want to thank Bob Hathaway and his colleagues for their partnership. You have no doubt uh, been watching the East China Sea with growing concern and perhaps trepidation since at least September 10th, 2012, when the government of then Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda purchased three of the five Gaoyu Senkaku Islands from a private owner. China claimed then and continues to claim, in fact, Foreign Minister Wang Yi strongly reiterated this point last Friday night at the Brookings Institution, that it was this Japanese action, this nationalization of the islands that had been under Japan's administrative control already that fundamentally altered the status quo and was the cause of the escalation that followed and that continues to unfold. China and Japan now face, the whole world faces, a situation in which planned or accidental events in the vicinity of these islands, islands and surrounding waters that have no intrinsic geostrategic value and that are of unproven economic worth, accidental or planned events there could plunge the world's second and third largest economies, 21% of the world's population at least into war. And the United States has made it clear that while it takes no position on the ultimate sovereignty of the islands, it would enter such a conflict under its treaty obligations to Japan. So the situation is fraught, to say the least. It is fraught with emotion in both China and Japan, as you know. But that emotion, uh, issues of culture, arguments about history, are not our focus today. We will explore the emotional and cultural side of the conflict on Tuesday, October 29th, when Michael Yahuda will be here to discuss his book, Sino-Japanese Relations After the Cold War, two tigers sharing a mountain, and we hope you will join us for that event. But today our focus is going to be on China's strategy in the East China Sea. And we are honored to have three experts in the field to help us understand this extremely dangerous patch of ocean. Uh, Lise Odgaard is an associate professor at the Royal Danish Defense College and the author of a recent monograph titled China and Coexistence, Beijing's National Security Strategy for the 21st Century, which is published by the Woodrow Wilson Center and Johns Hopkins University Press. It was written during her time as a visiting fellow here at the center in 2008-2009. Welcome back. Dennis Blasco, our, our second speaker today, served for 23 years in the U.S. Army as an intelligence and foreign area officer specializing in China and served in tours in Beijing and Hong Kong. He is the author of The Chinese Army Today, Tradition and Transformation for the 21st Century, uh, the second edition of which will be out in 2012, and their full bio data are available at the door. I, I won't read them all now. We are also honored, honored to have as our discussant this morning Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt, who is Senior Fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis, or CNA, which most of you know. Rear Admiral McDevitt is the author of numerous papers on maritime security and on U.S. policy, uh, US security policy, especially in East Asia. During his uh, long and distinguished Navy career, uh, he held four at-sea commands, including command of an aircraft carrier battle group. He was director of the East Asia Policy Office for the Secretary of Defense during the George H.W. Bush administration and served for two years as director of strategy, war plans, and policy at SyncPAC. He concluded his 34-year active duty career as a commandant of the National War College in Washington, D.C. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we are first going to lead off with uh, three uh, brief presentations. We will then ask uh, Rear Admiral McDevitt to comment on the papers which are being written and which are the foundation of these discussions before we open it up to Q&A from all of you. Please. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, in the meantime, I want to say thank you for
um, hosting this talk. I'm very pleased to be back. Uh, I had a very good time when I was a fellow here, and it's always interesting to present uh, your work at the center. So I welcome any comments, or we do, uh, for this work, which is a work in progress, and uh, will still uh, be corrected. Um, while we're waiting for the presentation, I could say that uh, the talk is titled, uh, as you s may uh, see have seen before, Peaceful Coexistence, Deterrence, and Active Defense in China's East China Sea Strategy. And so the, this work partly builds on the book that Robert Daly mentioned that was published here last year and partly on Dennis's work on the PLA. And its concepts of deterrence and active defense. And we've tried to merge them in this paper, which is one of the more difficult cases when looking at China's general foreign policy pattern. Uh, we would argue that they pursue a strategy of peaceful coexistence. Um, and we sort of look at the East China Sea because it's one of the more difficult cases for China. Uh, uh, it's one of the cases where you can debate to what extent do they sustain this pattern of coexistence. So that is kind of the basis for the whole uh, presentation or the idea. So. I don't know where did she go? <laughs> Our chief tech just headed for the exit. So I, I don't know if that's yeah. a good or a bad sign. Yeah. <coughs> well, people do have the handouts. Do they? Yeah, okay. they do. You've got handouts. So uh, I don't. if you'd like to oh. proceed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, do you want me to put it? I have got it on a USB. Might be better to just. Okay. Well, I'm saying, you know, we can go on without it because uh, people do have the handouts. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I it should. It on the desktop. Yeah, nor do I. But it was there before, though. Called W something Yeah. But it was up before. Sorry about that. And if I don't know how to do it. Thank you. Sorry. Technical problems. We'll now proceed. Uh, there are four parts to the talk. The first, we will just briefly outline the East China Sea issue. Secondly, we'll talk about China's maritime strategy, which is, in a sense, the main part of the talk. And what do we mean when we talk about coexistence, deterrence, and active defense? Third, we'll talk about the international domestic reactions. And four, we'll touch upon the implications for regional security. And you're welcome to ask questions to expand on that later. First, briefly, uh, the East China Sea issue. And I should mention uh, that we see this from the Chinese perspective. So this talk is not about our sort of view on what's going on, but we're trying to look at how does China see it. So if you looked at Japan, obviously they would have a different version of what happened and when the conflict started. But anyway, 
Seen from the Chinese perspective, in September 2012, the Japanese government purchased uh, these disputed islands from a private uh, Japanese citizens, or in, in to be more specific, they purchased three of the islands. And that then led to popular and governmental Chinese protests, uh, people walking the streets, and the Chinese government uh, protested, obviously, against this seeing it as, you know, a step which China had to respond with to in some way by m making it clear to the Japanese that this was an unacceptable move. Uh, China, what China did was to expand the Chinese law enforcement uh, capacities and also its maritime military presence, predominantly with civilian capacities, but also with some military capacity. And the Japanese uh, then stepped up its monitoring of the Chinese presence, and it also increased uh, its, publici its publication of what the Chinese did in the area so as to discredit the Chinese and uh, explain to the world that they felt that China was intruding uh, on Japanese rights. Looking at uh, this sort of series of incidents and development of the conflict, um, we then pose the question, to what extent China's objectives and strategy in the East China Sea are changing the status quo in a way that contributes to escalation and the use of force? Because a lot of people just assume that China's behavior is sort of Benevolent in this case, and it automatically contributes to escalation and the use of force. Uh, but we wanted to actually look at that question and see to what extent is this the case. Um, our starting point for that is, of course, the various claims and the differing views that uh, the states involved have on this conflict. And whereas China sees the East China Sea and the islands as ancient Chinese territory and disputes Japanese sovereignty, Japan, on the other hand, says that it, it in, uh, in 1895 it occupied what, what was effectively a, you know, territory that had no owners or it had the status of terra nullius. And Japan doesn't even recognize that there is a dispute. Uh, so, you know, and for that reason, it's really difficult to even have a dialogue on it with China. The U.S. is the per third party who's involved, and the U.S. acknowledges Japan's administrative t control. And as was earlier pointed out, uh, they have said that it is covered, the area is covered under the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty but the U.S. does not take a position on sovereignty issues. So the U.S. is kind of walking a tightrope between not getting involved in the actual conflict, but on the other hand, trying to um, be uh, a loyal ally towards Japan. <coughs> what kind of strategy does China um, use in this in its maritime strategy. Well, we argue that peaceful coexistence, even if this is a sovereignty dispute, uh, also applies in this case. And China essentially approaches uh, the conflict or the dispute from that point of view. What does peaceful coexistence mean? Well, uh, the objective uh, with this kind of strategy is to secure that China obtains a greater role in international politics, uh, but that this happens without jeopardizing relations with other states. So China's starting point is to try to expand its influence without sort of aggravating relations with neighboring states or with the United States. The principles uh, that peaceful coexistence rests on, they're well known, they're inscribed in the Chinese constitution, and they're repeated in, in most or all of China's defense white papers as a sort of basis of Chinese foreign and security policy. 
These principles are not particularly inventive, but they're sort of long-standing principles that indicate that countries should have a right to pursue their national interests uh, so long as these interests do not bother other states. Uh, so the principles are not particularly cooperative. They do not indicate an extensive agenda of cooperation for international relations, but rather they sort of imply that states should have the right to be left alone as long as they don't bother others. And this is uh, what lies in these principles about mutual respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, non-interference, equality, which means equality between governments and states, and peaceful coexistence. How does that apply, or how is coexistence applicable in the Chinese view in sovereignty disputes? Well, the way China sees it, it, it's trying to change the status quo in these disputes, increasing uh, its own position or furthering its own position, but and it does so in part by changing the balance of power, uh, and in part by arguing that other countries should accept its interpretation of international law, which is a historical kind of interpretation that differs from, from what other states around China would argue should be the legal basis, namely that of effective control. However, China, in China's view, they try to uh, come about this change without the use of deadly force. And that is their claim to stick to the sort of, or I it to the principle of peaceful coexistence, and in their view, approach this dispute in a non-aggressive uh, manner. So, in contrast to what is often sort of written in the press, in China's view, they may have become increasingly assertive in this dispute. Uh, they have had these claims that we state for decades, that we listed on, the on one of the first slides, they've had these claims for decades, but only now have they got the means to be assertive about the claims and try to manifest them. So their actual point of view haven't changed much, but their ability to, uh, to sort of realize these objectives have been enhanced. And so they're just using the means they have to assert their claims. But they, at least ch from China's point of view, they're not doing it in a sort of aggressive way. So in the East China Sea, what is China trying to do, uh, or how are they trying to play out this pattern of coexistence? Well, they're trying to carve out space for China alongside the U.S. and Japanese presence. So they're not uh, trying to or attempting to achieve hegemony. They're not trying to throw the others out. That wouldn't be very realistic. And one thing, if you look at chi the Chinese history of, of strategy, they are pretty good, I think, at setting themselves realistic objectives. So they don't try to push the others out, but they try to carve out space for China alongside the other two. They do this predominantly by enhancing China's civilian maritime force and also, as I said before, by encouraging acceptance that states might subscribe to different interpretations of international law. So there should be some acceptance uh, uh, or some they, they would like to reach the stage where the three powers can agree to disagree on the legal basis of their presence in this area. However, unfortunately for China, their assertiveness, or what they see as pure assertiveness, is by the others perceived as bullying or aggression. Seen from China's point of view, they intend to protect uh, their long-standing claims of sovereignty, uh, which is in <coughs> you know which they see as being their rightful or their right to do so. But the others, for reasons which we can touch upon later, interpret China's actions as bullying and as aggression. So there is 
a, a signaling and a communication <coughs> problem between China and the other powers in the dispute. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lise. Uh, as some of you may know, I try to focus on what the Chinese themselves say about their own military policies, intentions, and capabilities. And while I think that the uh, Chinese government is very clear in its official statements about its national level grand strategic intentions, I have many questions about operational and tactical details. And as Bob mentioned, as recently as last Friday, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi reiterated that China seeks to achieve its objectives peacefully without war <coughs> and that China does not have the uh, strategic intention to challenge or even replace the United States for its position in the world. But sometimes China's intentions may not be as clear to us, uh, especially when they use words like hegemony, which we seldom use uh, in statements when they say things like, we will never seek hegemony or behave in a hegemonic manner. That means something a lot more to them, I think, than it does to us when we hear it. And of course, we uh, always must constantly assess whether China's actions are consistent with its stated policies, because as we all know, governments often do have secret policies and objectives that are not stated openly. The concepts of peaceful coexistence, active defense, and deterrence continue to be part of the foundation of China's foreign and military policies. Um, and are, as mentioned before, continue to be mentioned in uh, many official documents. It may be um, obvious, may be too obvious to state that active defense actually fits very nicely as the military component of peaceful coexistence. These uh, concepts were developed at a time when the CCP perceived itself as relatively weaker than its major enemies, and this resulted in the adopt adoption of a strategic defensive posture, which continues to this day as China assesses its international environment. Despite its preference for achieving strategic objectives without going to war, and this goes back all the way to Sunza, China has not renounced the use of force to protect its core interests, including protection of sovereignty and territory. <coughs> no one should be confused by the name active defense. Chinese military has read Clausewitz, and it understands the necessity of conducting offensive actions at all levels of war, and at times it allows for preemptive actions to counter an impending attack. But active defense is still basically a strategically defensive posture based on a stronger enemy making the first move, whether it be at the political, strategic, or operational level. While there's been a lot of discussion about when China might conduct preemptive or offensive warfighting operations. In my opinion, there's been a lot less analysis on deterrence as part of active defense in China's overall strategy. In fact, as the PLA uh, Academy of Military Science book, The Science of Military Strategy states, Warfighting and deterrence are two major functions of the armed forces. We generally focus on the warfighting aspect. Almost all outside studies on China's deterrence posture examine its nuclear policy and sometimes consider Beijing's efforts to deter further step toward Taiwan independence. But as we examine every nut and bolt of new equipment that comes into the inventory, and how all of that enhances warfighting capabilities, it's easy to overlook how this new equipment also affects China's deterrence policy. For the Chinese, 
Deterrence includes much more than just the military means. It also seeks to use diplomatic, political, and economic tools to achieve its objectives. Significantly, in Chinese doctrine, deterrence is considered a method for achieving strategic objectives without going to war. From their perspective, China's deterrence posture includes much more than nuclear deterrence and the deterrence of Taiwan independence. We, again, in my opinion, often overlook the objectives defined in the science of military strategy of deterrence to uh, stop foreign invasion and to defend sovereignty, to deter conspiracies of internal and external rivals, and to protect the sta stability of their national political situation. For example, it was only this year that for the first time the DOD report to Congress mentioned these more expansive objectives with regard to China's deterrence policies. Consistent with uh, Thomas Schelling's theory on deterrence, the PLA understands that deterrence may seek to dissuade an opponent from taking a certain action, or it may, to, may seek to compel opponents to change their behavior. But China defines its deterrence posture as self-defensive in nature and differentiates itself from states with offensive strategies that seek to compel opponents to act according to their wishes. In either case, however, military force or coercion is an essential element of deterrence. But, the re but retaining the use of or the threat of the use of force does not obviate China's preference for peaceful resolution to the situations it uh, encounters. The science of military strategy says that credible deterrence requires three things. The first is a capable military force. And this is something that we've all watched progress over the past 15 years. The second element of deterrence is for the country or the state uh, seeking to deter to display the resolve to take action as necessary to achieve its deterrence objectives. And these actions can be taken in the form of military exercises, parades, uh, ex military exchanges, and weapons tests among other things. Through a combination of these methods, China seeks to gain momentum in its deterrence posture and take the initiative to apply psychological pressure on its opponent. And then finally, the third element of deterrence is that the deterred parties must respond and must be made aware of China's capabilities and the resolve to use force when necessary. In short, deterrence requires a credible military force, demonstration of the resolve to use that force, and an acknowledgement by the deterred that it has taken note of China's signals. Two good examples of China seeking to maintain momentum in the vicinity of the Senkakus were the flights just earlier this month of the unmanned aerial, aerial vehicle and a PLA bomber in international airspace. While some have called these flights provocative or a provocation, they can also be interpreted as part of Beijing's deterrence strategy. But the science of military strategy also recognizes that deterrence may fail and result in escalation or war. Therefore, the book repeatedly emphasize caution and prudence in decisions to undertake military force. The PLA's caution in deciding when to use the military option is based on its own timeline for modernization and its assessment of its own strengths and weaknesses relative to other countries. Just as active defense fits into the peaceful coexistence strategy, the officially published schedules for economic, national economic modernization and military modernization 
share the same milestones of 2020 and completion dates of 2049 or 100 years after the founding of the PRC. Beijing measures its progress by calculating comprehensive national power, which includes economic, political, military, scientific capabilities in comparison to other nations. Despite its recent achievements, China, however, still sees its comprehensive national power lagging the United States and several other countries. In 2011, I think is the last uh, judgment that I've seen published, and China at that point listed itself as about five or six uh, amongst the nations of the world in CMP. And a lot of this is because in its own version of exceptionalism, Chinese leaders will constantly divide any measurements in China by 1.3 billion. And as a result of this, and, and especially the per capita uh, estimate of their progress, these modernizations timelines have not changed 2020, 2049. In particular, Chinese leaders assess that the PLA has made absolute progress in its capabilities over the past 15 years, but they will say it is still lagging in most capabilities compared to advanced militaries. Consequently, PLA leaders currently are stressing training and personnel development as much as they are uh, issuing new equipment to the forces. Complicating this issue is a growing nationalism among some elements in China who see the PLA's new equipment and want China to be even more assertive in protecting its claims to sovereignty. It's not clear exactly how much China's leaders are affected by these nationalistic voices, but they are becoming louder and, and can be very outspoken with regard to the situation in the East China Sea. Despite the progress in PLA modernization, its economic development and political military or pol political diplomatic efforts, China's deterrence posture was not sufficient to deter Tokyo's actions last September. With the failure of deterrence, China then reverted to its active defense strategy and, as we've heard, portrayed its reactions as justified because of Japanese provocations. We can look at this as an example of what the PLA calls legal warfare to justify their actions. Beijing then chose to deploy primarily civilian and military capabilities in the vicinity of the Senkaku to demonstrate China's resolve to protect its territorial claims. In the past year, China has conducted roughly, uh, it varies between Chinese and the Japanese count, but roughly 60 patrols, usually by multiple ships over multiple days from the civilian maritime surveillance force, which is now part of the new China Coast Guard, which is controlled by the Maritime Police Bureau. Occasionally, uh, civilian maritime surveillance aircraft have been dispatched to the area, um, but, and also, uh, PLA Navy ships have patrolled around the islands a few times, less than 10 to my knowledge, much less frequency than the civilian agencies. In general, the PLA Navy has maintained its presence over the horizon. Beijing has also declared its intention to strengthen new, the newly formed Coast Guard, specifically this past January, it announced that over the next five years, 36 more ships would be built for the maritime surveillance uh, force, and another 11 Navy vessels would be retired and incorporated into the uh, maritime surveillance, now China Coast Guard, after removing their heavy armaments. These actions, again, can all be interpreted as an attempt to increase China's deterrence posture and maintain momentum to prevent further encroachment on what it claims as its sovereignty. However, these actions have not yet 
achieve China's objectives and rather have contributed to the escalation of tensions. Moreover, the presence of so many aircraft and vessels in this sensitive area increases the chance of miscalculation and unexpected activities by nationalistic elements from many parties could further complicate the situation. Thank you. We'll now go on to look at how the other countries respond and how does China's domestic uh, audience respond. First, if we look at Japan, although China is trying really hard, <laughs> China or Japan doesn't really acknowledge, at least not in public, that the status quo has changed, and nor does it acknowledge that China has any rights in the vicinity of these islands. On the other hand, Japan doesn't try to force China out of the area. That would be probably also be a very dangerous thing to try to do at this stage. Um, however, Japan uh, experiences pressure from its domestic audience who would like to see a heavy-handed approach uh, towards China, and Japan often presents China as fairly aggressive. Also, I guess, in cases where they're exaggerating a bit what actually happened in various incidents. Unfortunately, Japan's first priority is not stability. I guess it depends how you define stability. It's a pretty flexible term, but usually stability, I guess, require that you give and take, you give a little, not just per pursue your own position. And for Japan, the most important thing is to maintain undisputed sovereignty over the Diyo Senkaku Islands. Um, and their second priority is to preserve uh, stable relations with the United States. And only on in a third place, we would argue, comes stability. So that doesn't really help the situation perhaps for understandable reasons, but nevertheless. The U.S., how do they respond? Well, they're walking a difficult tightrope between trying to uh, prove to China that their testing of the alliance doesn't work and it stands strong. On the other hand, they don't want to get involved in the actual sovereignty dispute. The U.S. does not acknowledge like Japan, that the status quo has changed, and nor do they acknowledge that China has any rights in this area. They continue to monitor the situation from a distance, and they haven't really seemed to step up their presence or done anything active um, to, um, to counter China, but they do present China in general terms as an aggressive state, and they also do avoid criticizing Japan's policy in public. Their priority seems to be stability, but again, what does stability mean? There is, I guess, a concern for the U.S. is to sort of maintain things as they were and not really acknowledge or in any way imply that there is any acceptance of a change of interpretation in international law um, and they also, of course, want the situation to stay the same in the, sa in the way that they will have said they will defend Japan if that were to be necessary in this area also. So, you know, depending on how you find stability, but at least maintain things as they are, in that sense, that's a main priority for the U.S., and they also uh, have a key concern of showing to China and to the rest of the world that the U.S.-Japan alliance is unbroken and that they can you know, meet this, what they see as a challenge from the Chinese together. Um, only in third place, we would argue, does come improved relations with China. So that is also not contributing much to um, 
to decreasing the tension level, again for understandable and for good reasons, but the dynamics that are created are, as Dennis said, somewhat problematic. How does China respond? Well, as Dennis said, they have streamlined the, li streamlined the lines of command within China's maritime bureaucracy. They've also increased the presence in the East China Sea in order to speed up a change in the balance of power. At the same time, China is experiencing increasing domestic pressure for more assertiveness, and they also present Japanese actions as aggressive. For China, the main thing is to demonstrate ability to defend sovereignty, uh, to demonstrate to the others that they are in this area and they intend to stay there, and they cannot be pushed out whether they like it or not. Only a secondary concern is stability for China. Um, and third, on a third place, comes to maintain stable Sino-US relations. So again, while it may be possible to explain China's position, it again does not help decreasing tension. So what is the result for China of its strategy? China is by now a de facto power in the East China Sea, and they have already established a semi-permanent maritime presence, which is maybe predominantly civilian, but it's also military. And that presence, which serves to protect what China sees as, as its sovereign rights, I is has occurred alongside the U.S. and the Japanese presence. Japan has trouble maintaining an equal presence with Chinese vessels and aircraft, so they're, you know, they're stepping up uh, their efforts to have the capabilities to counter China and devise money on their defense budget to do so. And nationalism also, as Dennis pointed out, increases the pressures on both governments to be more assertive in this dispute. So essentially, while China has shifted the balance of power, we would argue in the area, they have not obtained legitimacy for their interpretation of international law. So it seems almost no one accepts this argument of China that they should agree to disagree for good reason because it would open up for you know, similar claims in other areas and a sort of very unstable situation globally in terms of what is right and wrong behavior <coughs> in this kind of dispute, which, which most states, even if they were to accept the Chinese position, wouldn't want to open up for. So while China has achieved some things in terms of shifting the balance of power, they haven't really persuaded the neighboring states that they have a right to do so. And so Essentially, China's strategy does contribute to escalation and conflict. They probably hadn't expected that because, as we said earlier on, they're following a sort of standard behavior of Chinese foreign policy, relying on coexistence, and that usually works for China. But the problem here, I guess, is that in this type of conflict about sovereignty, China sort of lays claim to have historical right and pursues a concept of right and wrong conduct that, that no one else uh, can subscribe to. So that's kind of what creates the problem here. With these words, we would like to finish. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> Mike, if we could ask you please to comment, and then we'll open up to questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate and, and uh, comment on this uh, really uh, challenging and interesting paper. Um, in your introduction, you talked about my distinguished career, and I must say every time I hear the word distinguished used, I think of my granddaughter when she saw me in a tuxedo when I was a few years ago, and she said, Grandpa, you look so extinguished. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I'm, I, I'm not extinguished, but um, this was an interesting, this was an interesting uh, uh, paper to review. And I should say right up front is the, uh, I'm 
my comments are based upon the written, uh, the paper itself, as opposed to the very excellent presentation that we've just received. Um, I think the first thing that jumped out at me is uh, the, the uh, statement that peaceful coexistence is China's grand strategic context. Uh, and I thought the paper uh, went into some detail to explain the background and the basis for that, but uh, for those of us in Washington, I guess, who are kind of watching what's going on day in and day out in, with China, peaceful coexistence is not the sort of word that would come tripping to your off your tongue when you think about China's grand strategy. You think about, you hear about peaceful rise, uh, you hear about uh, the China dream, uh, you hear about uh, uh, peace and stability on China's periphery. Uh, but so I thought one of the interesting insights uh, on the paper was to was to go back, if you will, to the beginning, uh, uh, looking to the Chinese constitution and what have you to at least attempt to make the case that peaceful coexistence is really China's grand strategy. Um, I must say, uh, when, when I reviewed the paper, I, I would have liked to have seen uh, some commentary or some, at least some reference to some of the other interpretations that have been written about China's grand strategy. Uh, I know that Mike Swain, a number of years ago, uh, did one. Uh, uh, Aaron Free, uh, Freeberg has done one. We've had lots of people talk about China's grand strategy. And, and the one thing that I think, uh, as long as you're going to make that claim that you need to have in there is at least some commentary or assessment of what other people have argued is China's grand strategy. Uh, the second point I would make has to do with at the very beginning. I, it just struck me that you're, in, this may be just the nature of a short pa of a paper trying to uh, summarize a longer problem is, is the historical context of how the Senkaku uh, Dayo uh, 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 crisis evolved and in, in the background was very perfunctory, I thought, very uh, 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 quick. Uh, and there was one thing that jumped out at me that really uh, kind of surprised me is at least the implication, perhaps I'm being overly sensitive, but the implication that it's all America's fault. Uh, uh, that, that uh, now I'd be f the first to say that Washington really muffed it in 1951 during the peace treaty with, uh, the San Francisco Treaty with Japan. We could have resolved in one fell swoop the sovereignty issue over uh, over the Senkakus we, in uh, Dakto Takashima by just acknowledging one of the two claimants who had sovereignty, and those issues were addressed. But the peace treaty or the, or the the peace conference decided to take a pass on all those and pass these unsolved, unresolved sovereignty issues on to us, and we're all living with them right now. But to say that in 1996, or to imply that in 1996 that um, that our, our, when we did the uh, uh, joint guidelines for security alliance for the 21st century with Japan, that that directly uh, led to a bunch of uh, right-wing Chinese or Japanese students to go and uh, raise a flag on the Senkakus, I think, is a bit of a reach. Uh, it, or if, if, if that's really the case, those dots need to be connected. Uh, in this regard, I would, I would commend to you uh, taking a look at Richard Bush's Perils of Proximity is a good discu discussion not only of uh, the different Japanese and Chinese views on uh, the whole range of issues in the East China Sea, not just the Senkakus and Dayos, but it also has to do with the, the demarcation of the EZ, the difference between uh, China's desire to have its, the EZ extend to its uh, continental shelf, which ends at the uh, 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 Ryukyu Trench or Okinawa Trench, whereas Japan's position is to split the difference down the middle of the East China Sea. Uh, and so, uh, but he goes into a lot of those sorts of things, and I would think that that would be uh, that would be helpful background context. Uh, There were a number uh, of really provocative, I would argue, uh, uh, statements on what China wants or what Beijing wants or what Beijing's policy is. For example, China seeks acceptance of its regular presence in the vicinity of 
uh, the uh, islands in dispute alongside the Japanese by uh, pressure by means of civilian capabilities and by encouraging recognition that both historic claims and effective uh, control are legitimate basis for sovereignty. That's a very specific assessment of Beijing's objectives, and I would like to either have you indicate that that's your interpretation or that there is some source for that from the Chinese because it, it was not evident in the paper that with, uh, in terms of documentation and footnotes, where you, how you reach that judgment. I very much like the analysis of uh, peaceful coexistence as a revisionist strategy, um, and I would emphasize the word revisionist strategy. Um, it's a very intriguing proposition, uh, and I would argue that the central discussion of the fact that Beijing is trying to create a divergent definition of international law, according to what you have indicated, um, basing sovereignty on historic rights uh, and, or the historic record without regard to actual jurisdiction or effective control. This is a really central issue, not only in the East China Sea, but in the South China Sea. And so uh, what I would like to see uh, is more elaboration of that judgment, because I think it's quite important uh, because, for example, I've been doing work on the South China Sea and East China Sea and recently had a gathering of international lawyers uh, to talk about all of the issues, and, and only peripherally did the issue of China trying to uh, base uh, its interpretation of international law and historic rights come up, and that was only with regard to the nine-dash line in the South China Sea. And so if this is a broader issue, that Chinese legal scholars are pursuing, I'd like to hear a lot more about that, I think, because I think that's really a central, a central issue for policymakers to understand where Beijing is coming from when it comes to international law. As you said, quote, China is attempting to change the status quo in the East China Sea uh, in the sense of changing the balance of power to make China and Japan rough equals in terms of maritime capabilities for securing a semi-permanent patrolling presence in the era. Moreover, China proposes an interpretation of the rules of interaction which diverges from Tokyo and Washington's definition of international law by arguing historic, historical entitlement and not merely effective control implies so sovereignty. So if we, as you alluded to in your briefing, I didn't see it in the paper, but in your briefing you alluded to the fact that, that uh, were China to be able to essentially have a separate definition of international law, there is a high probability that chaos would, could, uh, could result. Um, and it, what that suggests, though, is one of the things that people have argued on and off in, uh, at many of these uh, conferences for years is, is China a status quo power or is it not? And it, at least my conclusion, based upon your judgments, is China is not a status quo power. It is. It is effectively trying to change the balance of power in East Asia. In fact, it is changing the balance of power in East Asia in its favor. And it also wants to change the accepted norms of international law by, and to its uh, point of view by promoting this historic rights as a new norm. Uh, so this has, as I say, suggested implications for the South China Sea. And as Dennis pointed out, this also is what a number of U.S. Uh, uh, analysts have looked at on one of the, th the three warfares, legal warfare, that China is essentially attempting to use or to reshape international law to be able to uh, advance its own interests, uh, which is not a surprise. I mean, countries try to advance their own interests all the time, but by actually trying to, to reshape the, inter the international legal system, uh, strikes me as, as being very, uh, uh, very provoc potentially provocative. <sighs> provocative in the sense that when all of East Asian states are comfortable with the extant consensus interpretations of international behavior, because I would argue they believe it, it provides some assurances that they are protected from potentially capricious behavior of a China that seeks uh, substitutes uh, 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 for law, legal uh, rules of behavior uh, 
uh, b actions on its own terms. How far, when, we, when China talks about wanting to change international law to recognize historic rights, how far back do historic rights go? A th thousands of years? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean? Uh, I must say I was surprised um, In one of the bottom lines, I guess I would say here, is I was surprised, and you, you reached the, the judgment on page 7, that China's strategy of combining peaceful coexistence with deterrence and active defense allows Beijing to signal non-aggressive intentions toward neighboring states while allowing China to defend its claims. I would say, if, I would say that they're sending out the wrong signals if they think that they're sending out non-aggressive signals. Uh, and in fact, these are the, the signals are not being received that way in East Asia or in Washington, and we see the reaction of countries in the region who are m m more closely bandwagoning with the United States and building up their own defenses because of the uncertainties this provides. Uh, when I got to Dennis's part of the, uh, uh, of the presentation, uh, this is obviously an area that I've spent more time working in, so I was uh, much more comfortable uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, his uh, looking at looking at his uh, his assessments. Uh, I wanted to make one point about the act of defense that I think is central to the argument, which is um, again the act of defense is in fact inherently defensive, absolutely true. But as Dennis pointed out, it also has a very uh, pronounced preemptive piece of this. In other words, where China will claim it's not just somebody shoots at them first, that, that, they, have to, they, that they don't have to wait and take the first shot, but China, China claims that if you act diplomatically to challenge our sovereignty or if you uh, are taking some action that we have the right to preemptively attack as part of our active defense strategy. Well, again, this suggests a degree of capriciousness uh, that if you're a, a country that lives in the shadow of China, how would you feel about taking, if you examine this act of defense strategy and China says, don't worry, it's only defensive, I'm only defending myself against attack, but then can also argue that I don't like what you're doing and I perceive that as a threat to my sovereignty, so I'm going to whack you. Or as Deng Xiaoping did to Vietnam, I'm going to teach you a lesson. Uh, and so, and so uh, the act of defense, I think, is also when married to the notion of, of a new interpretation of historic rights and, uh, uh, and I mean, a, a, a new interpretation of in international law based on history, or essentially to give China more flexibility to essentially do what it wants to do. <coughs> the combination of those two things is potentially very destabilizing in Asia. And so, uh, uh, I think it's very important that we not, that we at least understand this connection between active defense and changing the rules of international law and what the implications could be. So with that, thank you very much. I'd like to invite both of you to respond briefly before we open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much for the comments. They're great comments and a lot of them I would just say we have still got to, to do that part of the work yeah. like uh, looking at other analysts' concept of grand strategy. Um, yeah, so that will be included in the revised version. Um, and it wasn't also, it wasn't the intention to give the blame to the U.S. for, <laughs> for this. <laughs> so we probably As need I to revisit I that I may be hypersensitive, well. that's all. That's all. No, that's fine. So you mean, I accept all of those comments as, you know, points of revision. Um, thanks for the comment of peaceful coexistence and law. Uh, and I agree with you that it's a highly problematic <laughs> way of seeing things. However, I think this is how China sees it. And the whole problem here, the reason why we try to look at coexistence, as I said in the beginning, is because this is a problematic case for China. Nevertheless, in China's view, they are non-aggressive in because they do employ predominantly civilian vessels uh, mm. that are not heavily armed, and they are trying to signal non-aggression. Similarly, they are saying, to my best of knowledge, we may need to reference it more, that 
while they have a different understanding of law, they could accept having that coexist with the Japanese, U.S., and other neighbors' different interpretation. However, w when it comes to this legal concept, China sort of walking on two legs because on the one hand, they are pursuing mm -hmm. you know, a presence here in other areas, as you alluded to there in the South China Sea. They try to establish effective control over some islands because they do understand that's how the others think However, I think it's important to stress this is not what China thinks because the short version for China is that, you know, in the past uh, 150 or some years or, you know, when all this, when the West and Japan mm -hmm. came to China, they sort of encroached on China's rights. They took these areas and at the time that China's civilization was dominant in Asia, a different concept of sovereignty applied. So, you know, they were sovereign in these areas, according to China, on a different basis. And there is some truth to this, mm -hmm. because Japan could just, you know, overran parts of China because there was no presence there, because it wasn't necessary. Then they came, they took parts of their territory, and then, you know, after the war, then they turn around and said, we've changed the rules, sorry, you can't have this back. So the way China sees it is, you know, we need to correct this because this is tied in with the fall of the Chinese civilization and that humiliation. Um, so they just don't accept the point of view. What they think is this should be corrected and then we can talk about, you know, what rules apply. So while it's understandable that they should think this, I guess, it's not very, you know, it's a very provocative way mm -hmm. of, you know, changing the legal basis for a claim. Of course, the reason it's not acceptable is that what China says really is that this is historically our rights, but we can't really exercise effective control in these areas because we don't have the power to do so. So we accept uh, other states' presence, but we also feel we have a right to do as we please, uh, when we please, without notifying you. And that's totally unacceptable, obviously, to all the other countries. Um, so China's point of view could never, for good reason, gain acceptance from the others. Unfortunately, China sees itself as being generous here because they see, you know, this is essentially their areas. Mm -hmm. It's a domestic problem. You don't have anything to do here at all. So we're being generous here by letting you use this area for this, that, and the other. And uh, <laughs> to me, that's a sort of, and China's view, I don't think it <coughs> it's going to go away. So that's kind of the more problematic part, actually, and not so much the buildup. And I agree, you said, is China status quo power? No, they're not. But they're not necessarily being aggressive. But the more serious problem is the sort of changes they pursue uh, and the implication of mm -hmm. that for other regions as well, where there are similar problems in South America and other places. You don't want to open up to that. So there's a limit to how can you respond beyond just trying to, to maintain the rules as they are. Thanks. Dennis. Well, I will admit to um, recommending that um, we drop the literature review in the earlier drafts. Uh, not being in a PhD, I sometimes get a little bored when I'm reading all these literature reviews and talking about talk about theory. But it's in it's in a lot of it's in uh, Lee's book on peaceful coexistence, and I'm sure it will find its way back into future iterations. Um, we may have, between us, a slightly different uh, view, and while, yes, I agree that uh, China is trying to change the status quo, and it has changed the status quo in uh, the Senkaku's area, I would say, however, that China is still trying to work within the vast majority of the international framework as we know it. And it's not a revolutionary power in the way the Soviet Union sought to be years and years ago. 
I would also say, and Lee's and I have talked about this, that China, I, I don't think, explains itself very well, especially in its uh, official statements by people talking um, back and forth and, and in meetings and things. You really have to work to go into their um, written statements to, to pull out a lot of this stuff. And they could do a lot better in defending themselves and, and explaining their policies rather than just saying that we are, you know, that we love, we're a peace-loving nation. Um, with regard to the whole preemption thing, and I think this is, uh, this is, your reaction was what 90%, I think, of uh, foreign reaction is to when they read about active defense. They focus on the preemption point. But our good friend Dean Chung mm -hmm. has even said, has written that um, basically China does not have a doctrine of bolt from the blue. So what we are going to see prior to any preemption, even at the strategic level, which they do talk about, we're going to see some buildup in tension, some signaling back and forth. Uh, so, you know, uh, to me, the implication that China, just because it feels like it one day will go out and make an attack on somebody without uh, having some sort of reason for doing that it is probably no I didn't mean to suggest a bolt out of the blue no, that, that's less right. likely and uh, so uh, the whole point about active defense is that it's an interaction inter interaction thing um, Oftentimes, it's you know a strategic spiral of escalation, which we're we're seeing now, and I think um, as we many of us have talked about, uh, we do find ourselves, China, the United States, Japan now in uh, the security dilemma, for what China thinks is self-defense or non-aggressive. Other countries are interpreting as aggressive and therefore taking their own steps that then cause China to take more steps and you get the spiral. Well, that's a great lead into general discussion. Uh, if we could invite uh, questions, please. There are microphones on the left and the right. And if you could please introduce yourselves, I'll try to take questions in the order that I saw hands go up, uh, Bonnie and Alan, and then we'll move down to the front, please, over on the left. I'm, I'm sorry, the back, short, down to the back. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, presentation. I look forward to, uh, to reading the, uh, the paper. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, I think in uh, one of the earlier slides, Lisa, you said something like uh, China is, uh, is in order to, we want to achieve its goals but doesn't want to jeopardize relations with, uh, with other nations. I, you know, I think increasingly those are objectives that are coming into conflict for China. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, I would posit that China is willing to take risks and put in jeopardy its relations with other nations to a certain extent. It's, I think it seeks to estimate what the impact will be and whether or not that impact is acceptable for China. Now, sometimes it may miscalculate. And I think we saw in the case with the Philippines in the uh, Scarborough Shoal incident uh, where the Chinese seized the shoal and perhaps miscalculated how strong the Philippines' uh, reaction would be. I would argue also that the, that the Chinese actually drew lessons from the Scarborough Shoal that they are applying to what they're doing in Japan and with Japan in the East China Sea. And I wonder whether you address that in your paper. But I think it's not enough just to say that China is unwilling to jeopardize its relations with other, with other countries. I believe that China increasingly is willing to accept some impact. So that's my first point. Um, one of the, I think, very last things that you said, Lisa, was that China didn't expect this outcome. And so that is related to my first point. Did they really think Japan was going to roll over? Uh, when they started sending uh, their civilian uh, ships? Um, probably not. 
So what did they expect? Did they miscalculate in this instance? So I'd be very interested in drawing you out on that. And then my last comment um, is a really a sort of a question for Dennis. Um, and that is, uh, was this really a case where deterrence failed? In all of the discussion we've had, none of you have mentioned that it, in fact, uh, these islands uh, were going to be purchased by the governor of Tokyo, Ishihara, and that he had uh, actually raised a great deal of money from the Japanese public. He had publicly said that he was going to build structures on these islands. So if, if Japan, the government, had not actually purchased these islands, um, one could play out what an alternative set of circumstances would have been. And I would argue that it would have been far more destabilizing. But I don't know if that's how China saw it. I do believe that the Japanese explained in great detail to Beijing. They actually thought that they had won Beijing's tacit approval, or at least you know, willing to tolerate it. Um, and again, Japan miscalculated in that sense. They were wrong in estimating this reaction. But I would say that in this case, deterrence really didn't fail because the outcome would have been worse and the Chinese just saw an opportunity that they then leaped on. They exploited the what they then named a provocation by Japan just as they exploited a, a provocation by the Philippines in the Scarborough Shoal instance and they did so successfully. And so I would say that China had a pretty clear idea at the time as to what they were doing. They successfully exploited the opportunity to change the status quo in China's favor. They have contested uh, J Japan's administrative control, and they've done so successfully, but there has been a cost. Thanks for the questions. They're really great questions. Um, the first one, um, I would distinguish between China's you know, general behavior towards their neighbors and their behavior in the sovereignty disputes. And one reason for looking at these uh, sovereignty disputes is that they put, as we have sort of alluded to, a question mark between China's willingness to coexist with its neighbors. I think if you look at its general foreign policy uh, also in its neighborhood, for example, towards this, uh, the Central Asian states, its uh, work in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, its general policy towards ASEAN in, a, in an economic and also in a security sense. I think China has most definitely pursued this pattern of, of coexistence and has put great effort towards demonstrating that it's going to be a benevolent neighbor. It's also solved most of its territorial disputes coming out of the Cold War, starting with Central Asia and sort of not trying to bully these states, I would argue. And also with Mongolia, same. China so showed self-restraint because Russia was there, and Russia also wanted a place uh, <laughs> in that part of the world. So China has been pretty pragmatic and constrained in many ways. So this is an interesting case to me because the pattern is partly broken, and the question is why. And as I said, I do think other factors are at play here, and Dennis also mentioned them, that this is <laughs> this is the area where ch where China feels uh, that justice has been un uh, done to them, uh, injustice has been done to them from the Western and Japanese powers. They really feel that this is a domestic issue, where you know different rules applied when they had these areas. So you can't just come and take them and then say now the rules have changed. They don't accept it because this uh, takeover from the Western Japan was tied into China's fall as a civilization. But that's not how they explain it in public, so they don't communicate their message on this very well. They assume that other people understands and knows this, but other people often don't understand and know Chinese history. So they will just say, we have the right to this area, boom, we don't need to explain why. 
And that's a communication problem on their side that makes people think, what are they on about? This is ridiculous. So that while they could be better at also explaining this, I think that this is not <coughs> for them just a matter of strategic calculation, unfortunately, because then it would be easier to change. This is something that you know has a resonance among people and how the history is read and presented in China. And that makes it a pretty stable element of China's uh, policy and an and element that where different dynamics unfortunately apply that are more hard to handle. So that's how I would uh, describe it. Did they expect the outcome? Did they really think Japan would roll over? No, but again, because China strongly feels it has the right to be in this area, I, th I would argue it's partly willing to ignore you know, what other people <coughs> think. Yeah. What's the good news here <coughs> is because some people ask, where is the red line and what would it take for China to use force? I'm not sure that when I look at China's history of using force and they have drawn a red line, the bad news is they do use force to the best of my knowledge. But I don't think they've really yet drawn the red line here. So seen from their point of view, they're still somewhat constrained in their pattern <coughs> of behavior. So it can still be managed. However, you know, for them, it's it's also about testing the U.S.-Japanese alliance uh, and whether it's strong enough. So there are other factors at play that are strategic. But it is also a matter of saying, we want, we're staying here. And irrespective of what you think and whether you like it or not, we do feel this is ours. And, you know, so we're coming back to, to demonstrate that. Thanks. And I, I think, Bonnie, that uh, China <coughs> did um, expect, was at least hoping that they could get recognition of a dispute about the Diaoyus from Japan, and that hasn't happened. Um, as for your other question, I would, my response would be that um, China felt obviously compelled to act when uh, Tokyo did even these modest steps, because what you described, as, as we all know, would have been much, much worse. But um, and could have caused a much greater response from China. But in, in many cases, well, well, what the Chinese saw this is a change of the status quo in a very sensitive area. Uh, prior to this, you know, we had seen the fishermen having disputes and all that kind of stuff. So this was a sensitive area from China's perspective. Tokyo changed the status quo and exacerbated it in the press, and I don't know if it, this was what the official words were used, but, you know, nationalization of the islands was the, was... That's Chinese term, not yeah. Japan. Well, <laughs> okay, you know, I, I don't know whether that's what the Japanese call it, but that's what, you know, the Chinese are presenting it as. I'm sorry? Transfer of property rights. Transfer of property rights. So in, in, in the interest of time, I, I wonder if I could um, go to Alan's question, and uh, this is, the discussion's fascinating, but if you have slight, short questions, short answers would be great so that as many people as possible get a, get a chance to participate. Thanks, Will. Alan Romberg, Stimson Center. Uh, on China, first of all, I think you made an important observation that a goal is to change the status quo. I think that's something that needs to be understood. Uh, when you talk about deterrence and say one of the goals of deterrence is to achieve strategic objectives, I have to say I think that's turning the notion of deterrence somewhat on its head. Okay. So I'd be interested in uh, any further comment on that. Further on China, I think they did have choices. I don't think, Dennis, that this was absolute. And there were voices in China that said, let's understand this is to preempt Ishihara san. So uh, we don't need to react in a uh, very uh, uh, proactive way, but the, the and, and including in the government, there was some reaction at first in that way. So a decision was made not to pursue that particular course, but to take the one they took. And I would add to your goals of China that one of their goals specifically is to show a change in the status quo. You mentioned it orally, but it's not in your in your bullets. And frankly, to say their approach is one of non-aggression as has already been discussed, I think is a rather special Chinese definition of this, which as you've pointed out, other people are not really accepting. Second, on the US, 
Uh, you talked about one of the U.S. goals being to show it's a good ally. That, of course, is true, but I think it would be useful if you were to explore the uh, origins of the U.S. position, uh, which is longstanding and goes back into the 1940s before World War II ended. And had it not been for the ECFA study, which showed possible hydrocarbon resources in the area, and then a very belated claim by both Taipei and Beijing, uh, the U.S. would have gone ahead and followed through on its uh, position on residual sovereignty, not just administrative control, and returned that to Japan uh, along with uh, uh, Okinawa. So uh, I think it would be useful to explore that. I also think you, you said the U.S. has not contributed to decreasing tensions. Maybe I share Mike McDevitt's uh, sensitivity, but I think U.S. diplomacy, in fact, has sought uh, to decrease the tensions, even though the other aspects you mentioned are true. Uh, finally, I, actually, I'm not sure that agreeing to China's view, which is that there is a dispute, would in fact turn all these other disputes on their head and create chaos in the system. Uh, after all, former Japanese governments have accepted that there's a dispute there. Uh, the Noda government obviously did not. The Abe government does not. Uh, this position on there is no dispute is the same one that China takes on the Paracels and that Korea takes on Dokto Takushima. Uh, I don't think that uh, it might turn the strategies or the positions of those governments on their head, but it seems to me that it, it, it uh, doesn't necessarily uh, mean that uh, everything will be turned into uh, some sort of a mishmash of chaos. Okay. All I can say, Alan, about uh, their doctrine saying deterrence can be a means of uh, achieving strategic objectives. That's what their doctrine says, and that's the way they prefer it to be. And what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, get to the end point without having to go to war. One of the points that we try to make is, uh, or that I kept trying to put in, is without the use of deadly force, you know, and why I tried to mention deterrence absolutely requires the threat of force and could be coercive, often is coercive, but they have avoided the use so far of deadly force, even in mistakes. Okay, just briefly, um, did China have to act in this way? No, and I think opinions even within China's PLA is much more varied than people realize. We also try to write about that in the paper, I guess, by saying that often you know, foreign correspondents look to the hawks in China's military thinking they represent general point of view, which arguably they don't. So there were indeed discussions about this, and there are various opinions to the best of my knowledge. However, you know, <laughs> there is, you know, as the way I see it, a dominant policy line, and that's the one we describe here, uh, and that is to change the status quo in much the way we have, we've already been through. Um, is there a dispute? Well, it depends how you define a dispute, but at least, you know, recognizing that there is a dispute is sort of a, a precondition for having a diplomatic dialogue on how to decrease tension. So in, th in that sense, I, th I think, uh, you know, recognizing that calls for certain types of behavior that are just not open to the parties now, uh, and that might be, you know, a useful uh, thing to open up to. Thanks. Mike, you had a comment? Just a couple of quick points. On the issue of, of what Japan might have done other than uh, purchasing the, the uh, having the government purchase the islands, uh, presumably Sony could have purchased the islands instead of the mayor of Tokyo. So I mean that's that that was an alternative that was bef that the Japanese government could have pers pursued and not. And so for what it's worth, uh, or Toyota. Um, the other point I wanted to make is the status quo has been changed. Uh, we need to it. it the, when you talk to people at the tactical level, uh, the, r the operations of the Japanese Coast Guard and now the Chinese Coast Guard have become very routine. Everybody knows what everybody else is going to do. One, one group of uh, Coast Guard vessels stays on their part of the, 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 the territorial waters, and other, the, the others stay on the other part and what have you. And so th there is great stability and great professionalization, pr professionalism amongst the mariners at sea right now. 
in terms of this. And so it, we've settled into a new, is a, a new normal, a new status quo. Question, please. Uh, right in the middle. Yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I'm Ian Reinhardt with Congressional Research Service. Uh, and you seem to give the impression that these, this course of action is not meeting China's objectives. I think that's what you said. And, and here behind you on the outcome, it says that, that it's contributing to escalation and conflict. And I'm wondering, uh, what is the assessment uh, among Chinese policymakers, and especially the PLA? Do they think that this is working? Again, brief answers if we could. So we have time for yeah, one more question. So yeah, so that's a good question. Again, I I guess uh, <laughs> China does acknowledge that you know they're not getting all they want. It, does that mean the strategy is not working? Well. They've changed the status quo. That's important for them. They've maintained a presence. They probably can't be pushed out of the area very easily. But they haven't changed the other's point of view, and that, I, to the best of my knowledge, does bother the PLA. Yeah, they don't understand why people can't. They don't always understand why people can't see their point of view. Perhaps because they are quite inward-looking in many ways, and they simply don't know that other people don't recognize how they see these disputes, which often, unfortunately, others don't. So that's a brief answer, thanks. Well, didn't Wang Yi uh, again mention that uh, they can't uh, engage in dialogue because Japan does not uh, acknowledge the dispute? So, you know, they, they still are calling for acknowledgement of the dispute and therefore they haven't achieved that objective. Thank you. My name is Tetsuya Toyoda, a fellow this year at Woodrow Wilson Center, working on territorial disputes in East Asia. Well, I'm working on historical legal aspects, and today's topic is, is uh, strategy. So I think well, when we talk about the China's strategy, it's good to look at things from the Chinese perspective. But uh, then the views from the Chinese perspective, I'm still wondering what is the strategy for China? Because in 2012, in, as of August, the Japanese government was under the control of the DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan, which was considered labeled as pro-China and competing with LDP con considered as anti-China. And the general election was expected in November or December, or actually it took in, in place in December. And wh when th was the purchase by the government anno was announced in September, the Chinese government blamed the, the DPJ to make sure that the conservative party, LDP, would take power in Japan. And I was surprised in December, three days before the general election in Japan, the spokesman of the Chinese foreign ministry well, declared that they, are they were concerned about the rise of nationalism in Japan. Well, as if to make sure that the LDP should they have the landslide victory, and it did. So there is, that is the reason why I wonder whether there is any Chinese strategy <laughs> against Japan. <laughs> perhaps, well, they are just driven by the, well, as Professor Odegaard just mentioned, driven by a feeling rather than strategy. And there is a sense of deja vu that, well, 72 years ago, well, some, well nearly a century ago, when the Japanese, well, Japanese Empire took over the Manchuria, mm -hmm. well, yeah. they were the general, Japanese general public was widely supporting it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing in China today. And at that time, there was no strategy for Japan. It was driven by the, the same Japanese military commanders which were out of control of the Japanese government. And the question is whether there is any strategy for China uh, well shared between the Communist pa Party, uh, Central Communist Party and the PLA. Okay, thank, thank you. In the interest of time, if you briefly, maybe all three of you on whether this is strategy or whether this is behavior, what do you see? 
Well, I still think that this is a strategy in the sense that China has objectives and they have defined means to pursue those goals and they do it fairly consistently. That's not to say that there aren't differences of opinion within China and that therefore, you know, over time and it can change, but, you know, within the period we have described, I would argue they still managed to put together an a, strategi a strategy, just as I would argue the U.S. does. Thanks. And, and the point is that the strategy is adaptable to changing circumstances, but some of these concepts that we've talked about may continue to be the underlying uh, principles, even as names change, peaceful development, peaceful rise, but some of these concepts pretty much uh, remain. However, as China's comprehensive national power grows stronger and they make a different evaluation of their position, their strategy could change then from when they s no longer perceive themselves as the weaker party. I'm increasingly coming to the view that China's reputation as brilliant strategist is misplaced uh, and that, uh, in fact, uh, they are very tactical and issue-oriented and focused on whatever is on the inbox at the moment. Uh, and the reactions, uh, in many cases, uh, seem to be uh, designed to uh, shoot themselves in the foot, literally, in terms of longer-term strategic goals. So I'm willing to say the jury's still out that the, the, the heirs of Sun Tzu are sitting in Beijing right now. <laughs> Build, building off of that and thinking about your, your conclusion that China has been surprised at their inability to convince neighboring countries of the legitimacy of their claims and that they are surprised that their actions have been seen as escalations. If, if that is true, what does that say about the political culture and the processes that made these decisions after 30 years of opening, extensive consultation, after a period prior to September 2012 of at least two years, in which the pivot had been announced, in which we had the uh, Tianan Hao, uh, the Chonam incident, there was, it seems to me, ample warning and ample consultation for them to have been informed. So if they really didn't foresee this kind of response, what does that say about the myopia of that process? If, on the other hand, they did foresee and were willing to accept this response, what does that say about their goals and their will to achieve them? Yeah. And I, I, I raise that just in closing. Uh, I also want to recommend to you, if you're interested in going back into some of the, the history uh, that was discussed here today of the dispute, the Council on Foreign Relations, Elizabeth Economy and her colleagues have an excellent new site, which we will link to on our page for, for this event, which has timelines, videos, interviews, a lot of very good links. It's something that you can easily make your way through in an hour and a half, which is a very good review. Uh, thanks to the three of you, to all of our speakers, to Lise, Dennis, and Mike for coming today, and to all of you. We hope that you will join us on October 29th when Michael Yehuda uh, discusses his book, and uh, we'll try to set that up in a format uh, which is uh, a conversation and to have a lot of time for uh, questions and, and responses from the panel. Thank you again very much. Thank you.